So it's six o'clock and time to begin. So welcome to the XHR, the Xavier Center of Historical Research, to yet another history up, and this time on the Great Goa land grab. We are really happy today, this evening, to have with us Dr. Solano da Silva. And Dr. Solano da Silva is an assistant professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at Wits Pilani, Goa. He primarily teaches development studies and political theory. And his research has looked at electoral politics, urbanization, and land use planning, focusing on Goa. Over the past several years, Da Silva has been researching on changes in land use planning. In fact, his dissertation project was on the dynamics of land use planning, a case study of Goa. So he's, in fact, a specialist in this subject. He recently, in 2022, co-authored a book with Kenneth Bo Nielsen and Heather Betty, titled The Great Goa Land Grab, published by Goa 1556. And if you would like to purchase a copy, it's available right outside. Uh, so really welcome, Da Silva. And thank you for making time and coming over here and updating us with this literature and with your book. Thank you so much. Uh, this session will be moderated by Dr. Anthony Da Silva, who is currently the director of the Xavier Center. He has a PhD in social psychology from the University of Michigan. And he has taught for many years at Nyamadi Vidyapeet, which is the Pontifical Athenaeum in Pune. His present research interests are focused on Jesuit history, spirituality, and culture from a multidisciplinary perspective. And he has edited this volume on the Jesuit in South Asia 2021, and more recently, the Jesuits Go On in the Arts 2023. Welcome to all of you, and hope you have a nice evening. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Xavier Center. Thank you, Father Tony, Father Rinald. Thank you for having me over. Thank you all of you for coming. To <laughs> I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit overwhelmed trying to explain these subjects. I'm not a subject subject expert on land use planning. I'm not a planner. My degrees are in development studies and economics, and I teach politics as well. So consider this a view from, from, that, from that perspective, a perspective from political economy, if you like. OK, so let's, let me go ahead and begin, begin with a note from my fellow authors, the authors of the book. So Kenneth Bo Nielsen, who you see here, Heather plumbridge Beatty and myself, we, we put together this book, The Great Goa Land Grab to consolidate some of the observations that we were making over many years. And Kenneth today sent this message which I would like to read out. Along these lines, he says over here, I'm sorry I could not be here with you today. I'm sure there would be many old and new friends present in the room. It is flattering and rewarding when one's books get attention, but deeply saddening that the thematic of the book is even more urgent today. More than ever, when we originally sat down and wrote it, in other words, Kenneth is saying the book is already redundant, and that's something I'd like to bring you back up to speed. Solidarity comes cheap, they say, especially when one sits in privileged positions in the global north, like me. But for what it's worth, I would like to express my solidarity with and my deepest admiration for all those who are engaged in the real struggle for Goa's, for Goa's land, its nature, its environment, and its people. It's a message from my colleague, Kenneth. I am going to present something beyond the book. I'm going to touch on things that we spoke of in the book, but we go beyond that. Because as the data is already redundant, that is the speed at which the powers that be are working and, and it would be insufficient for me to come and express, to present the book in the way it is written uh, would be a bit of a problem. I want to start on a personal note and I'm saying this because I think this is also why 
we have all of us here. This is a personal journey in research and activism. The two came together in a very, in a very, uh, in a very sudden way. Two thousand and six. I used to work on very different topics, electoral politics, and those sorts of questions. But they came together very suddenly, and I and I asked myself, why am I so moved by some of these subjects? And I think they have to do with a legacy of having regular movements into the wild spaces that were afforded us from our parents, walks with our parents. I remember the parents calling me Major uh, Edward Menezes would take us for walks. Uh, Rosendo um, Mendonca would take us for walks. My father would take us for walks. Repeatedly, that is all we would do. And these are, these are my nieces who are here with me today. And we do some of this stuff. It's my son. We do some of this stuff. And I hope that in some way the connect with the land, connect with the environment will begin for, with our children because of things like this. Because it seems to be etched in me. And I have a feeling it's etched in all of us. We're all so passionate about this land. I come from this village of Bilen, a charming village. And it all came, it became, I was living this nice life, walking around like this, working on very different research topics. But something happened in 2006, which changed everything. This is our beautiful Saule Lake in Pilen. The date is very important, October 2006. This is a photograph that was taken by a Russian tourist of the lake. And we got it back because she shared it to us. Because the very next month, this is what happened to that say, very same space. 91 trees were cut. The hill was destroyed, burnt mercilessly for two days, ash flying right up for kilometers around, animals running into people's homes, and those who asked questions were at the receiving end of tough calls. Okay, and this was this awakening. I remember Father, um, uh, the, the father who was in charge of the social justice action, Father Maverick, just coming there weeping copiously at the sight of such horror. The real estate party is very much here, a born party actually, and I don't want to say anything more. So we ask ourselves, I ask, I begin by asking this question, what is land? And there is a fantastic quote, there are two quotes that I want to read, just reflect on them. This is by Carl Foliani, who was this great, um, who understood capitalism in a, in a completely different way. And he said, he says, the economic function of land is but one of many vital functions of land. It invests man's life with stability. Land, that is, invests man's life with stability. It is the site of his habitation. It is a condition of his physical safety. It is the landscape and the seasons. We might as well imagine he's being born without hands and feet as carrying on his life without land. There is another quote that I was struggling to find by Tanya Lee, uh, Veronica Strang, an anthropologist, who says, land is meaning, meaning system. It's a system of meaning. It connects us with our past. It gives us a sense of identity. Our memories are etched into it. We believe our ancestors are sleeping into it. Spirits are there. And land is infused with so many meanings. But in the economic logic that has overtaken our lives today, it is reduced to just one meaning commodity to be bought and sold. So when land or more broadly nature is subject to commodification as it is today and we're seeing it in its rapid space in Goa, then it can no longer support the basic necessities of human life. This is the stark warning that we are facing while we chase land and, it's, and, and in, in all its convoluted ways, packaging and its sale and resale. So now I ask this question. Despite having land use planning in Goa for over 35 years, why does Goa find itself continuously, ever, ever repeatedly, in land-related conflicts? And I want to respond to this in these four parts. The presentation that is to follow has these four parts. The first part is to look at the problem, the problem of land and the conflict around land, and the context in which it's taking place. That's the first part I want to do. Then in, the, in part two and three, I want to talk about the causes. 
This is bifurcated into two because first I want to talk about what I see as the immediate causes and then there are deeper causes, often unseen. I want to dwell on them and finally I want to throw the floor open for some reflections. Okay. So we ask this question, why does Goa, after 35 years, after being a pioneer in land use planning in 86, the only state that has land use planning along with spatial planning, that is zoning, to cover every inch of its land surface, why is that we pioneers, Goans, Ajib Lok, pioneers of land use planning, continually find ourselves in the situations that we are? So we started by asking this rather neutral sounding question. Goa has had land use planning for over 35 years. Has it achieved? Has it achieved its objectives? First, we want to ask, what were the objectives of land use planning? What was the promise of it? Why did we as a Goan society, as, as a society of thinking people who have very scarce land resources, and everything depends on this, everything depends on this. It is the master of all planning. Why does it? Has it achieved its objectives? So I want to first break up into two parts. First, I want to I want to cover what was the promise, or what is the promise of planning, and then did it achieve its objectives? So when we look at the regional plan documents, uh, there are we have had three regional plans from 1986: regional plan 2001, regional plan 2011, regional plan 2021, which is the one that is in force now, uh, along with ODPs. We'll, we'll see what these what these. When you peruse these plans and you read these documents, the following four stand out very clearly. These are broad, these are broad objectives. The first objective of planning was to balance the growing of an economy, how to grow the economy for the benefit of its population, very important. Not grow an economy for the sake of the economy, but for the benefit of its residents alongside with the protection of its environment, with the promotion of agriculture, and the fourth point, the regulation of mining. This you find through all the regional plans. Even if they come up with one tomorrow, it will have these objectives. But the detailing, it will, I mean, there is a, there's a detailing that happens after that. Now, the strategy to do this was, was to do these two things. The first thing was to create a social economic plan and the other one was to create a legally binding spatial plan. See these two have to go together. The first is a social economic plan. What is the kind of Goa we want for the future? What is the future we want our children to have? That has to be detailed out by looking at huge amounts of economic, social economic data understanding what we are good at, understanding the problems we are facing, where do we want to go, what is the vision we have for the future. And then very importantly, and I, just, and I want to really great, give great emphasis on this, is that this has to be translated into a legally binding spatial plan. In simple language, what this means is, whatever vision we are setting ourselves for, it must translate into how we use land. Because if you use land in a different way and you make us and you make a document with very nice sounding objectives, it will not work. It will not work. Professor Edgar Rivero, who started the TCP, uh, uh, the TCP department, is here with us today, and and he will tell us probably a lot more. Reading these uh, documents brought me to this understanding. Okay, so these two things: social economic plan and legally binding spatial plan. Now the spatial plan, the, the, I mean the planners of the day, people like Edgar Rivero, they had this in mind. The spatial plan was bifurcated into three detailing plans. A regional plan which is broad, then an outline development plan, ODP as we call it, and there was still another layer called the comprehensive development plan that would create everything of our infrastructure lines so that we would not have to dig up our roads a hundred times. All the infrastructure lines, everything would be laid out. This was the detailing that was emphasized. It is still there in the TCP Act. I have marked an area black because still they, we have had not a single comprehensive development plan and my argument is there is no incentive for it as I will demonstrate further. 
Now that was the promise of planning. Okay. Now I want to. So I have dealt with the first part, the promise of planning, and uh, I, I, I gave you a summary of the four objectives of planning and how it was supposed to be done: a social economic plan and a spatial development plan. So I summarized that part. Now I want to present to you: has the plan achieved its objectives? And I'm using two data sets to present this. And I leave it for you all. I'll make my observations. The first data set is that of zoning. We have tracked zoning from 86 till date. Okay, from 86, yeah. not very up to date, but till this date because the last plan was notified in 2009. So broad zones are mentioned there: agriculture, forest, natural cover, settlement, industrial, miscellaneous. What has increased? So these are zones we actually marked up. In 1986, the regional plan makers, the maker, the planners of Goa, had marked out approximately 8%, 11% for settlement areas. And this was projected to last for an extremely long period of time. We now have, we now have that figure has gone up to almost 14%, 13.62%. Yeah. This is an approximation. These are really broad approximations. Agriculture, very interestingly, was marked uh, out to be about 42% in 1986. Agriculture today, in our assessment, the amount of land that is zoned for agriculture is 27%. 42 has become 27%. This brings us to the to question, what about that commitment to agriculture that we have? Yes, people may not be interested in agriculture, correct? But there could be another way to, to put together a team that does agriculture. We need to look into that. What about food security for us? This has serious implications why we are so dependent exclusively almost on Belgium for our, for our vegetables, etc. Forest cover is interesting. It's very interesting. In 86, the amount of area zoned for forest, zoned means it is legally, legally protected, was about 38%. This figure is now about 34%. Okay, and these are these percentages may look small, but we are talking hectares, massive amounts of crores of square meters are, are gone. Now, the, the regional plan, the most recent regional plan, had come out with a category called, which I put as an asterisk there, natural cover, which is about 13%. Interestingly, uh, what they said, uh, the, the planners, today's planners said, you know, we don't know whether this is orchard land or it is forest. So every time a, 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 a construction takes place in such a piece of land, the forest has to do a survey. This is the reason why you have massive burnings, etc., clearing of bushes, etc., that is happening. And there is no clarity about this land. So we have actually sacrificed huge amounts of land because development is allowed in natural cover. So they have eased out all of these areas out and have opened them up for development. Okay, industrial has gone up marginally, about 1%, 1.17%. There are miscellaneous groups that are brushed together that use water, like water bodies, etc. So this is one statistic. A sharp decline. What do we observe from this? A sharp decline in agricultural zones. That means the TCP it's them, themselves have constricted the zones they're saving. They have marked out. A decline in forest zones. The sharpest is in agriculture, of course, and then increase in settlement and industrial zones. Now, there are some other details about areas that were added in the interim, but we'll come to that later. Now, leave this aside. You can say my stats are all wrong, and you know, yeah, you know, that time in 2000 and in 1986, what kind of methodology did they have? Now, let's look at the eye in the sky. This is satellite imagery, and there is more data, but I've taken one of them. I've taken one of the most granular cases. And in Bitspilani, we also have a GIS lab who's doing something similar. Now, I can share. I mean, I'm still waiting for the, for the granularity of the data. This is satellite imagery, and this is just of three talukas, Bardes, Diswadi, Salsef, the so-called high-intensity talukas. And from just 10 years, 2000 to 2010, from satellite imagery, we're seeing a massive amount of urbanization, 50% increase in urbanization just in these talukas a sharp increase in the fragmentation of green spaces. The green spaces are really being pushed out. And, and, and this, I mean, unless we contest satellite data. 
This is another uh, a chart that is made by a student of mine using census data and, and throwing census data to visualize it quite differently. What these maps are doing, they're very simple maps, they're beautiful maps, they're called chlorophets. They're comparing census data on urbanization from 91, 2001, and finally 2011. Our government has decided not to do any other census. So, let's see. Anyway, so, but this is enough for us to see. What it has shown is that you can see rapidly as you move your eye towards the right that the Goa has become uh, more and more urban. Now, this is not a bad thing. Most of us are living in urban spaces. Around today's uh, projection is that 70% of our population is in Goa is living in an urban space. This is not in, in itself a bad thing. If urbanization has a different format, if your planners have a vision that urbanization must be Delhi, Mumbai style, then, you know, then there's trouble. But urbanization can have a very different pattern, which I believe that we do have in Goa. It's ironic that we are the most urbanized state, apart from Delhi, Goa is the most urbanized state in India. And it's ironic that all the, all the people are attracted, not to a rural space, but to an urban space. All our tourists, etc., are coming from an urban space. All the people who want to work, set up a home in Goa are coming to one of India's most urban spaces. And there's something here that may be calling out to us that we may have accidentally found a very different pattern of urbanization and an urbanization that we should probably protect and be proud of. Not the Mumbai style, Bombay style urbanization, a very different, unique form of urbanization. How ironic that. The most urbanized state attracts so many to live and to visit. Okay, so it's not, pro but there is no, there is definitely, uh, the trend is very clear. We are becoming more and more urban. So there are, these are the two trends. The two trends, I just presented two data, I summarized two data sets for you all, maybe, maybe three. Okay, one was on zoning, the other one was on urbanization, and the other one was remote sensing data from satellite all tell us that land has transformed in the world. The use of land has transformed. It is unmistakably transformed and it has transformed very fast. Okay, And there is something of concern here about determining the future of this transformation that we that's a question for all of us. There are some strange consequences that have emerged as a result of this transformation. And I want to just uh, refer to a, just a few of these. There are strange paradoxes, dilemmas of development, dilemmas in Goa. Goa has the highest number of vacant or unoccupied housing, most probably because of speculative investment. Goa is the number one and defeats all other states in the number of unoccupied housing. And this is census data, so unless the government of India is wrong, in 2011, 22% of all the homes that we find, one in every four, is empty. It's ironic, at the same time, girls can't afford a home for themselves. This is the paradox. This is the paradox. And the argument is always made that, oh, it's unaffordable, so we should, we should do what? Yeah, we need to release more land. We need to increase more housing. Only then the price. This is a fiction. This is one of the great fictions in Goa. Yeah, and the, the, the estimate today, when, when, the, when the census officer presented this, he was, he was asked to never present this, uh, this data, but he was kind enough to give it to us. And it's available to read online. There's so many reports written about the shocking state of unoccupied houses in Goa. The other thing that we find is that we have packed, we have, we have thought of tourism in such a mesmerizing way that we have put so many eggs in that basket that ironically, the most booming sector pays the lowest wages. So nobody wants a tourism job. Very few people want a tourism job. They just want to leave Goa. And this is the reason for the continual out-migration of young people, unaffordability of housing, the complete shutting down of the Goa cooperative or housing boards, to leave us to the market, and we know how the market is run, the tourism sector that pays very few wages because it's packed and there is no comprehensive plan for it. And we, we observe demographic changes. This is an image that was being hidden from all of us, which is the Niti Aayog's image about 
Goa's unemployment being double that of, of India, of the Indian average. How ironic, the richest state has one of the highest unemployment rates. These are the paradoxes. And it all boils down to the way in which land is used. And I, that's an argument that I'm going to make. So there are two or three consequences. I want to go a little further. I want to press this discussion into further. The consequences for agriculture and development. Sorry, the slide is not very clear, but I'm going to read it out to you. This is a report that came from the Agriculture Ministry from their own. They said the staggering dependence of Goa on imports of vegetables and other crude items from primarily Belgium. We are the worst state. This graphic shows, and is, sorry, it's uh, not very good. We are, Goa is right down, down below the list, the worst state in terms of food security. This is a 2022 statistic by the government of India, that the worst state in terms of food security because we import so much and, we, and because we import, we pay also so much for bare essentials. Yeah. And we also see the fragmentation of green spaces. This is a, a graphic. Uh, Goa is on top here from bottom to top, but it's on top for the bad, for an extremely bad reason. Go, this is a parliamentary report, it's presented in the parliament in Delhi. The proportion of wells in decline is the worst in Goa. Therefore, tankers are wrecked. It's not, it's not. The sharpest declines monitoring wells, they're not deficient, but the drop is the severest. We also are observing heat islands, and I don't want to I don't want to keep on presenting graphics of this sort by the GIS team. We are supposed to have a climate action plan, which we do have. If we ever read that, it's quite shocking to see the kind of heat islands and the, and the propensity for, for, for flooding that we make low lying areas in Goa are going to face in the event of climate change. Fragmentation of green spaces as well, which satellite imagery has already shown. Okay, so th these are the, this is the, the nature of the problem. Everything that I've presented so far, I hope has convinced us about the nature of the problem. The problem that whilst we have had such a legacy of planning, we are faced with some serious consequences, which, which means that if planning had delivered, we should not have been facing such staggering issues. We should not have been facing some of these, at least some of them we should not have been facing. Therefore, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to present this because I wanted to convince us first that the problem exists. Because otherwise you may doubt that I'm answering a question or we are attempting to answer a question when the problem doesn't exist. Now why is this happening? Why is this happening? Now I want to go into the causes of it as, as we see them. Two causes, immediate and and deep causes, okay? So I want to deal with the immediate causes. This may be a bit lengthy, let me see how much time we have. Okay, try to wrap this up fast, yeah. How is land allocated in Goa, okay? We often think that land is allocated as a result of market forces, demand and supply, economics. This I don't believe anymore. There is an element of truth in it. But the market, the market is a system of rules and regulations. This for me is an essential is an essential way of understanding how the land market works in Goa. There are no markets without rules and regulations. If you if anybody wants a market without rules and regulations, they should set up shop in Somalia and Yemen. I don't see many businesses going there. That is a true free market. The markets that exist always have rules and regulations. Only then will you invest when there is security for your investment. And zoning, this image, I'm trying to demonstrate something by the image, zoning creates the market. Please, I'm trying to, I don't know how to emphasize this. Zoning de determines the market because when you, re when you zone a place, you open a frontier for the market. You say, now you can go here. This is a settlement area. You can do agriculture here. You can do forestry there. You can do mining here. 
zoning opens up, it sets up, them, and then it also limits the market. It says there are no go areas, eco sensitive areas. These are no go, they are not subject to the market for modification. So, just see, I'm saying some things that are so important that the act of planning, the act of zoning, either opens up a frontier for the market or it curbs and limits the market. And this is the only way we as a society can regulate our land use. We can say, we can determine the future we want through this by saying what kind of economic activities we want, where do we want them, and what are the things we will not compromise. It is therefore the master art, the master of all planning is land planning. So, however, this is a shocking uh, slide, but I, I mean, I, it's more shocking when you look at the end, the, the implications of it, but maybe we don't have time for that. Our reading is that spatial planning in Goa has been delinked from social economic planning. And I'll, I'll say this again. Spatial planning, that is zoning, is completely delinked from socio-economic planning. Today, everything that we hear as planning has nothing to do with socio-economic planning. It is only a zoning game, to say, put it in the most simplest form. Land zoning, that is spatial zoning and rules, have been altered for select parties at a huge cost. The cost is on us. And here, on that chart below are all the amendments, all the regulations that have been altered to pull aside the long-term vision of socio-economic planning. These are, for example, in the regional, the, I, I, we have categorized them into, into six categories, six innovative ways, if you like, through which the government of Goa has on the one hand, it's like that biblical saying, on one hand, one hand gives, another hand takes. In, in the view of this, one hand gives regional plan and six hands take away regional plan. Those six are these bulk zoning changes. You present a bulk of a draft plan to the public, your final plan is completely different. Classic example, going politicians love this. Piecemeal zoning changes, see how many are there. First they started from 88, from 19, 19, 1988, it should have been 98, it's wrong, to 2005. Now we have 16B, 17-2, which we're still fighting, and now there's a new one, 39A, in the, just being born. These are all to allow piecemeal zone changes. You come, it's a dukan. Come, come, we will change your zone on a case by Social economic plan is to be presented only as a discursive exercise to fool the people. Then ODPs, these ODPs, very interestingly, in 2008, the Gambar Kamath government, in a TCP board meeting, decided to keep ODP areas out of the regional plan. They don't have to follow the regional plan. They can do what they want. And this is the reason Professor Edgar Rivero resigned from the state level committee and we should all read his letter. He's there with us today. We should read his letter to see his, the shock with which he thought what was going to happen to Goa as a result of the way they were doing planning. The, so, and, and more recently in 2006, separate ODPs have been created. All the problems that we are seeing in Parra and Agua are because they've created new ODPs for and given those ODPs, there's one more step, they've given the ODPs to various ministers. Why has this happened? In 1998, in 1997 to 98, that time Manohar Parikar, he was the leader of the opposition, opposition member. He passes a private bill, he moves a private bill in the legislative assembly and he says that ministers should be members of the PDA. PDA was actually before that only housed by bureaucrats. Master stroke. The bill was passed. It's a unique case. A bill was passed which was moved by the member of the opposition, leader of the opposition, unanimously because they could all become ministers on the ODPs. And from then on, the decline in our urban areas is there for all to see. He did it. Why? Because it was a way of getting political friends and creating more coalitions. Okay? But the effects are on us people now. Then there are overriding legislations, which means that if I 
designate an area as an SEZ or an ITB area, ITB is what we have today, these no rules apply. It's a free for all. You don't have to agree, agree to zoning regulations. Delton is creating a huge township in Pernet as a result of being an ITA area. Old Goa is going to have a massive, massive uh, hotel project in, an, in a forest and orchard zone because it's been granted ITA status. That means regional plan does not apply. This is what I'm saying. One hand gives, six hands take away. And then you have uh, building regulations that have been changed, like change for farmhouses, etc. I don't know, we don't have much time for this, but I, the observations, and this is an ongoing struggle that's happening in Goa, is we are tracking the amount of, I'll just come to the last, yeah, I'll just come to the most recent one. As an illustrative case, just as an illustrative case, we have tracked 17.2, which was an amendment passed by Vishwajit Rane. It's just a year old. It's just a year old. He passed it in April, so we're exactly a year, April last year. From April to March, as a result of this amendment, 16 lakhs has been converted. 16 lakhs. It gets even more interesting. Just before the code of conduct, in one week, and two Gazette notifications, 7th to 14th, exactly one week, 8 lakhs was converted. That means half of everything was done in one week. Now, if this does not enrage somebody, I don't know what will. Half of all the zone conversions under 17.2 done in a week, just before the code of conduct. And what are the zones that were lost? Most of them are orchard, natural cover. And you'll find something in yellow that says zone not mentioned. You know, the last weeks, that 8 lakhs that was converted, because they realized that some of us tracked these things, they didn't mention the original zones that were being changed. This is a democratic government. Yeah. Square meters. Square meters. 16 lakh square meters. Yeah. Of which 8 lakhs was converted in one week. Yeah. And here are the consequences we are seeing in our village, in my village of Bilen. This is the consequences that we're seeing. I just wanted to quickly run through you the irony. In Pilan, we have a lake, and the lake has a catchment area. The, um, this is the same place that was burned to ashes, and back to, uh, I mean, we tried to set, put it into, uh, save it. After lots of efforts, in December 2021, it was declared a wetland. And I want to run through this chron chronology, we'll be shocked. December 2021, Saula Lake declared as a wetland. It's here, two kilometers away, we can all go down, we can see this board. Now, we beautifully, we celebrate World Wetland Day a few weeks ago on, in February 2024, where we have the Environment Minister come himself, our MLA come, wonderful speeches about protection of wetland, some kids were brought there and they were told how it's important to protect the environment. And then, within 10 days, they denotified the area around it, the surrounding area they converted to settlement. The very, they declared it as a wetland, they declared that there's a buffer to the wetland, celebrate World Wetland and then they convert the entire zone around it into settlement. This is an image where we have put together in Pilan showing all the zone conversions in Pilan. I'll, I'll, you, you can't see them, the, the areas that are marked in, in, in sort of dark. I'll just summarize this. In five months, in five months, November to, November to February, our village a fairly active village, has got 22% increase in settlement area thanks to this provisions. 22% increase in the settlement areas. Our population has not increased. They are not breeding like rabbits. For nine real estate parties, simply that. And this is the reason why all of Goa, this is a micro story here. This is a story that is happening across Goa. This is why our newspapers in the morning, when we open them, we get acidity reading them because of the shocking things that the trees are being cut. This is being cut. Complaints are given, nothing happens. This is the amount of area we have lost in the village. 86,000 square meters gone because of this in five, in five months. 
see if your village is here, the top villages in Goa, Mandre, Old Goa, Chopre, Pilen, Marra, Asagam, top villages where these zone conversions have done in the, in the last, in the last one, in the last one year. This is just one year's, one year's data. This is a breakup of that 16 lakh. You can show the whole breakup. Strangely, posh places, Mandre, Old Goa, Parra, uh, I mean Asaga and all, are places which, and when this bill was moved, it was supposed to bring justice. It was done to bring justice, it seems, to ordinary people. The average size here is 10,000. It means that there may be a change, but it is smaller. They've taken the largest chunks of this. I can share the full distribution. Okay, I because of paucity of time, I want to I want to wrap. If I can have, could I have another ten minutes? Five minutes. Deeper causes. Deeper causes. Why is this happening? These are the amendments. Yeah, these are immediate causes. I want to go a little deeper, and this is hypothetical, a bit hypothetical. Why this is happening in Goa is because there seems to be an addiction to land conversion. Allow me to explain the, what is this addiction to land conversion. This is a chart of those zone changes from 1988 to 2005, and the vertical lines are all the changes in government. You know, we became famous or infamous for being a state with something like 12 chief ministers in 10 years, etc. And you see, and a hypothesis is that this is something to do with land ministries. Those who don't get land ministries bring down governments. Now, this may be a bit playful, and this is curious kind of correlation, but this is not. This is not. Look at our TCP ministers. Who's made TCP minister? I want to ask, truncated it. 2004, Babush Monserrat. Why is he made TCP minister? Because he does a defection from UGDP. He then, because he does massive zone changes, Manohar Parikar removes him from the ministry, he brings the entire government down. And then Babush Monserrat is rewarded for bringing the Congress party back. So he then he gives a gift to Goan people, which is Regional Plan 2011. And he reigns for another few years. And why is that? Because he defects from the BJP. Now the next person, the next TCP minister, Dikandra Kama, defector from BJP to Congress. After that, Manohar Parikar, some stability, <laughs> but not for long. Vijay Sargasai, Goa Foundation coalition partner, rewarded with TCP ministry. After that, Babu Kaulekar, when he is not required, why, he does, why is he given TCP ministry? Because he is a defector from the INC. After that, there is a troublesome person who is planning to, wants to become chief minister, compromises the chief, Vishnu Chief Rani, TCP minister. All, almost all defectors. So what, what's the point that I'm trying to make? Land ministries in Goa are used to poach, I'm going to say three things, are used to poach coalition, poach MLAs, reward defectors, and to cement poli political coalitions. That is, that is the political game. This is a complicated chart, but essentially says all the ODPs, if you look at who is given the chairpersons of ODPs, they are pretty much defectors again. So another danda. So Michael Lobo can do what he wants. It's a free reign. And anyway, we are dealing with ODPs from regional plans. So this is for me the, one of the deeper causes, the political, the political reasons for that are driving these changes. And I want to stop there and put it open for some reflections. Thank you.
Certain, I, I look at two levels of data. One is macroscopic, maybe that is a skill I have. And I think uh, that the analysis that I have prevent, presented enables someone, it enabled me for sure, to understand the changes I am witnessing in around me. I, because I see society as a set of rules. When the rules are changed, I see con consequences on the ground. My association with the Komnida, the Komnida of Pilen, is not good. It's one of the first, it's one of the most tiresome court cases that we have had for massive zone changes, is the Komnida of Pilen itself. So my analysis, working with them as an institution is not good, but the idea of land as common, so I'm saying this very emphatically, the idea of land as a common resource, truly common, beyond just the patriarchs, beyond the casteist mentality of world society, that for me is valuable. And that is something worth resurrecting, revisiting, and reimagining. It cannot be the old way. That is my response to the Yes, I, I don't think it is, but uh, I think that, yeah. We will have time after the formal session, so please let us proceed in an orderly manner. Uh, Luis and I had a regular discussion, right? Even yesterday we, we met at the keynote there, and we had started our conversation there, and it was good to see you. I, uh, Luis, after this part three, huh? then Agustin, you know, I had made an interesting point. I also, these are, I mean, I said this for a long time, I meet people seeing this. See, as a, as a, as a person who studies social sciences, I have repeatedly been reprimanded by my gurus not to write people off so fast and label them in a simple way, greedy, stupid, uh, you know, jealous, uh, you know, th these, uh, these, uh, these behaviors that I'm also capable of. But, but to see the structures, the structures that make people behave in this way. Why do people behave in this way? What are the structures? For example, and this, uh, I'll, I'll go back to one of my gurus, Professor Peter D'Souza, who attended our first book talk, and he said something so insightful. He says the market in land in Goa has become so virulent that institutions, age-old institutions have succumbed to it. The logic of commodification, to see everything as a commodity, has destroyed families, marriages, it has destroyed relationships, and it has destroyed the land itself. All institutions, our values have become market values now. We see things in a commodity. 
and he said that the land market is so powerful, our political institutions have succumbed. Sometimes we find the church behaving in strange ways. Sometimes we find ourselves behaving in strange ways. We find the best of people when it comes to an issue with land behaving in strange ways. And for us, we need to step back, I feel, to understand the structures why this happens. And for me, uh, coming back to uh, Mr. Bednikar's view, I really don't know. I can only speak what next. It's, uh, for me, I have a set of, if you ask me immediately what is to be done, these, these amendments need to be, they need to be on the streets and these amendments need to be thrown out. And that is a preventive check for me. My deeper question, when I put this slide up, reflection, one of the reflections I had in mind, I was asking myself, what is the reflection that I have? My reflection is there is no incentive for systematic social economic planning in Goa. There is no incentive because all our political actors, even our bureaucrats, are involved in land operations. That's it. So, you know, I, until this stops, I mean, the political, you'll have all ad hoc things. Ad hoc. Suddenly there will be, for example, soils are becoming a serious problem in Goa, the erosion of soils. So we have a Sadhguru come. There was one point something crores spent on entering into an MOU to save soils in Goa. Legislative Assembly question was asked in the last legislature, what has come out of that MOU that we had? They actually responded to saying nothing. Nothing. There is no incentive for a long-term plan because our politicians have become land-related. They invested in it. That's the structure of it. A new government is invested in it. It's my initial response. Thank you. Sorry, there's a question be behind you. Another thing which has to be considered is that the government doesn't protect the land only. Most of the NRIs have their great fear. Even those who are here that what happens if someone occupies my land? I have to fight in court. Even this government says that if they, we don't have any owners, the government will take, take it over. So that is another in, uh, incentive to people to dispose of the land while they are alive or while they are strong. Can you hear me? Yeah. I think the purpose of the microphone is so I don't hear I try to use the microphone to hear that thing with everyone. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, my question is going to be covering all of the grounds that the previous commentators have covered. And I'll start with the gentleman who I couldn't hear very well, but I think he said something along the line that it's a very good reflection. Just a very quick quote. How many people here are below 25 years of age? Yeah, you can be proud. Proudly raise your hand. So that answers one question for me. So that's telling me possibly less than 1% of the crowd is even interested in what you are discussing. That answers one question, just that hand raise. So the second question was very much in tune with what the gentleman ahead asked what then. I'm a strong believer. If a child who is born in Christian background must understand the Bible, they must understand the language in which the Bible is written. If you want to understand Hindu text, understand Sanskrit or Hindi or whatever sir. I think this specific language, and I know it's a very articulate, academia-oriented language, I think if it's made accessible in whatever way to the general public, which is 25 years and above, they may be possibly able to help you with what next. Do you have any thoughts on that? One more question and then we are
guys see and I'm a punch member. But I, I was very much interested in the full presentation what you have done. Being a punch member, I face with the Lord. It's something being a Lord, what you said, name it as commodity. I felt like it is a body, you know, I've been cutting down into pieces. So, a reflection I could say, why don't we all put focus on land use policy planning? So you should report various zoning, right? So in that you see there is no land use policy. Land use is not mentioned. The everywhere they are changing the changing in the settlement, whichever available zoning is there. And they are not very drastic way. So why don't we as a large uh, mass focus on land use and the population? Just two days before I was just you know going to uh, all these states in Goa and comparing the amount of land available in each state of Goa, I mean India, sorry. So in, in Goa, I think is that Goa is the last state where it is having 3,000 plus. Whereas if you see, see in other states, they are about 7,000. So the second question arises is, why are we accommodating other people in our state? Why are we allowing housing or accommodation in our state? So that these are the two questions. See, uh, the, when, when we speak about the problems faced by NRIs, when we, the, the answer to that is not to dispense with land use planning. For me, the problem is with land use planning. And it is because, as Joyce says, my, and it's the response to you as well, what I'm saying from, from what I have observed and what we have observed, not this is my story, is that the, there is a land use policy, but it is delinked from a spatial policy. Everything that occurs in the name of land use planning, I mean, the way it should have been done, is that we have a socioeconomic plan for a vision, and then we say, okay, now we're going to use land so carefully so that we can realize that vision. That is delinked. That's what I'm saying. Spatial planning is happening ad hoc. If you read, there's a simple document. If you read this, the annexure that uh, was fought by Goa Foundation, we have some lawyers here. Uh, the document that was tabled to put, to declare the ODPs null and void, you'll be shocked to know how this was a painting exercise. One uh, MLA goes off, a new chairman comes, and he simply changes the zone of four villages. The same person is in trouble in Sioli because of cutting down the trees. But if you look at the document, if you look at the analysis that was produced in the court and the judgment passed or the order that is passed by Justice Sonak and Valmiki Menezes, they say they start by saying it makes depressing reading. And they say this because if you look at the zone changes that were done in these four villages, Arpara, Nagwa, Parra, and uh, which is the other one? Uh, Arpara, Nagwa, Parra, Kanduli, Kangu. He has simply changed, he has simply increased the FAR with an ODP, with a new ODP. These are many siolings in the making. Imagine if that had worked. It would have been burning every day in Siol. So my my point is, my point is that there is land use policy, but it is dealing with spatial planning. Now, uh, how I agree uh, about this question about two two more questions I want to deal with quickly. I have been told. I have been told that this kind of presentation is very tough. Even my academic students tell me this. Today I tried to make it a little softer by putting images of my son and this that to connect with the crowd. It seems I've not managed to do that very well. So I want to just move to this slide. So it gives me a chance. Those who want to help with this cause, those who want to help with this cause, and I work closely, and I'm deeply inspired by the people from the Mauling uh, campaign who are sitting here and have become great friends. They are leading the cause, and in an innovative way, I am asking those to join us, join us, so that we can take this to the ground in a creative way. They said something very interesting, which I want to say this. They said to me when I met them, and I've quoted them here in this last slide, being an activist, having a life of public purpose is part and parcel of being a goan. It comes with 
being this identity. Gone are the days where we speak like Goenkars, like with a sense of entitlement. Being an activist is part of the job. And so I invite you to, to take this forward in a way that is more accessible, translatable on the ordinary uh, to the common masses. The final point is that I want to make is I do find ideologies of all kinds strongly, strong views of deep, I mean, nationalism blown out of proportion, usually smoke screens. As a student of history, history has taught us enough lessons. And I must say that it has, we've chased RTIs, etc., to find out all these zone changes. It was still not given to us. It has still not come to us. And I am very much of the opinion, it's very strange how cultural revivalists in our state never have a problem when mining has been extracted and given to China. Those are not anti-nationals. Those who question this, uh, you take away the steel reserves of our own country and give it to another country, a country that we are anytime going to go to war with, and that's not anti-national. The changes in land use, that is not anti-national. Those who are questioning it are anti-national. When I see rhetoric like this, I strongly agree with this position that yes, extreme kinds of nationalisms are smoke screens for crony capitalism at its, at its, at its core. Thank you very much, Dr. Solana. Please give us a very good Thank you everyone and have a good night.